Welcome to Acton Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. Since the COVID-19 pandemic hit and governments across the country ordered most businesses closed, people have increasingly turned to online services like Amazon to meet their needs. As a result, Amazon's sales soared as the company reported a 37% increase in revenue in the third quarter of 2020, with total revenues north of $96 billion. This, in turn, has led to some increased scrutiny on people like outgoing Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, whose personal net worth increased by at least $28 billion since the onset of the pandemic. Voices like former Clinton administration Labor Secretary Robert Reich have pointed to this growth in personal wealth, complaining that despite this massive increase in their personal wealth, they have refused to provide paid sick leave, raises, hazard pay, and more to their employees who are all suffering real hardships. But is this an accurate picture of what is happening? Today, I speak with David Hebert, director of the Center for Markets, Ethics, and Entrepreneurship, and chair of the economics department at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids. Hebert argues that people like Reich misunderstand, purposefully or not, what this accumulation of wealth means to both Bezos personally and to a company like Amazon, and how it has been a benefit to consumers and workers alike. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, You can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. I'm joined today by Dr. David Hebert, who's chair of the Economics Department, associate professor of economics at Aquinas College. His area of expertise lies in public choice and public finance, and specifically his research aims to address the question of why democracies around the world and throughout history systematically produce tax codes that are long complicated and certain numerous loopholes despite universal popular support for tax codes that are short, simple, and contain few, if any, loopholes. Although today we are going to dive into questions around the economics of the COVID-19 pandemic and concerns raised by um, numerous people out there about the way that those economic situations have operated. Dave, thanks so much for joining us today on Acton Line. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So as we look over the course of the last year, we see... A lot of economic results of the pandemic. Some of them are obvious to us. We see unemployment rates. Um, We see the impact on businesses that this has had, um, both through the natural outgrowths of people's reaction to there being a global pandemic and through choices in public policy. And we hear often claims about the way that certain industries have benefited from these circumstances. I'm thinking, for example, Amazon is a clear example of that, yeah. that a lot of people, when they don't want to go to the grocery store, when they don't want to go to Target, when they don't want to go to Walmart, mm-hmm. can, with an Amazon Prime subscription, find just about anything they're looking for, click the button, and in two days or less, it's at their door and allows them to get the things they need without having to be exposed closely to other people who might have the coronavirus. Yeah. Um, the complaint is that you see someone like Jeff Bezos, who's already one of the richest men in the world, mm-hmm. has become even richer as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. Is that a fair characterization of those circumstances and the results of financial benefit to Jeff Bezos? So it is and it isn't. So what what we're highlighting here is is the difference between the dollar value of assets that are held versus the dollar value of, of money that you might have lying around. Okay, so it is very true that Jeff Bezos today is about ninety billion dollars wealthier uh, than he was, you know, a year ago. Now a lot of that is because the stock price of Amazon has gone from, you know, one thousand eight hundred dollars a year ago today 
uh, to $3,280, at least as of sometime earlier this morning. Uh, It may have changed a little bit, but Mm -hmm. it's gone up by almost 80%. Now, because of that and because of the sheer volume of shares that Jeff Bezos owns in Amazon, it's true that he now has about $90 billion more in wealth than he did a year ago. The question we need to ask, though, is what can Jeff Bezos actually do with that $90 billion in wealth? Now, a lot of people have pointed out that he could use that money to pay his workers more, to give them uh, maybe paid sick leave, to provide maternity leave. Maybe he could even buy some vaccines for us, right? But to do this is to make a fundamental error. And what I want to do is I want to highlight this error with a couple other more common examples that we're all probably more familiar with. So in 2014, uh, I moved from Washington, D.C., where I did not need a car, thanks to the excellent public transit that's there, to a city called Big Rapids, Michigan, uh, which if you've ever been, if you haven't been, uh, Big Rapids is a lovely community. I think the world of it, but it is neither big nor rapid, okay? And they don't exactly have a a wonderful public transit system, especially not one that went from my house to Mm -hmm. where I was working. And so to get from my house to work, I needed a car. So I bought a 2014 Jetta, brand new, spent $24,000 on it, right? The car had seven miles on it, not 7,000, seven. Today, uh, that car has about 129,000 miles on it, and I could probably sell it because of some accidents and some stupidity on my part with uh, snow removal by shovel. Mm -hmm. Uh, I might be lucky to get $4,000 for it. So who stole my $20,000? Right? And that's a weird question because it's clear that this asset that I owned, which is my car, in 2014 was worth $24,000. Today it's worth four. So where did my $20,000 go? And, and to drive the point home maybe even a little more, not just the wear and tear that you've put on it from all of the driving or from snow removal with a snow shovel, <laughs> there's the part of it that goes from the $24,000 value that it has that drops the moment you drive it off the lot. Yeah, right? So the question here is, like, who stole that money, right? Because I spent the money, and now I could get less money from my car. So who stole it from me? And the answer is, of course, no one, right? Because we all understand that when you drive the car off the lot, when you drive it around a little bit, when you get in accidents with it, when you stupidly remove snow from the car with a shovel, that's going to depreciate or decrease the value of that asset, Now, let's compare this to maybe a house, right? So in 2015, uh, my wife purchased a house here in Grand Rapids for about $250,000. Today, if we sold it, uh, we'd probably get somewhere close to $450,000. So does this mean that we have an extra $200,000 sitting in some bank account ready to be spent? Well, of course not. The only way we could spend that extra $200,000 is if we sold our house and then used that money to buy stuff. That's the only way. The same can be said about Jeff Bezos. He doesn't have $90 billion sitting in his bank account, sitting there like Scrooge McDuck swimming through a bank vault or whatever. He has assets that are now worth $90 billion more than they used to be. Just like I can't take my house and go to the grocery store and buy groceries with the increased value, neither can Jeff Bezos do that with his stocks. He would have to sell them. So... What would be the argument then against the position that says, well, now that he's – his net worth has increased by $90 billion, Mm -hmm. um, then why shouldn't he just go ahead and sell that $90 billion and put that back into Amazon in the forms of the things that people like Robert Reich have Mm -hmm. said that Amazon should have, like you know, higher wages or sick leave or any of the other various forms of benefits that Robert Reich and some others feel Amazon workers deserve, but they currently lack. Yeah. So so one way to to think about this is – If the only way for Jeff Bezos to get access to that $90 billion in increased wealth that he has is by selling stocks, then we need to ask the question, do we actually want Jeff Bezos to sell Amazon stock? And I submit that the answer is no. Now, let's think about the humble beginnings of Amazon. Way back in like the mid-90s when it started, 
It literally was just a place that sold books. And usually, or most often, it was selling like used textbooks or used books between people. At some level, it was basically eBay, but only for books. Mm -hmm. Now, this made things tremendously easier for lots and lots of people. College students, for example, got access to lower-cost used textbooks than they could get from their college bookstores. They often got higher resale value on Amazon than they did if they sold it to the bookstore because they didn't have to pay the middleman between them and the eventual buyer. And so the college students themselves got some increased benefit as well. Now today, Amazon sells something like 12 million different products, ranging from things like books all the way to car tires, snowshoe or snow removal systems for your car, so the ice scrapers and everything, which I should probably buy one, right? So maybe I should do that since it just snowed and... We have snow now. Uh, So what Jeff Bezos has effectively done is made it very easy to connect different buyers around the country and even today around the world with different sellers around the country and around the world. And as a result of that service that he's performed for these millions and millions of people all over the planet, he has become fantastically wealthy. So in a free society, one characterized by the voluntary exchange of of people who are free and able to choose for themselves, the only way for me or anyone for that matter to actually earn an income is to actually perform a service for someone else at a price that that other person deems worthwhile. This is why the late great economist Walter Williams used to refer to dollars as nothing more than certificates of performance. They stand as evidence that you have served someone else in the community in a valuable way. So, for example, if I tried to serve you by throwing rice at your car, you probably would not pay me because I am not actually serving you. But if instead I came up to your car and offered to clean the windshield both inside and out for 50 cents, you would probably be willing to pay that. It's a very low price and it's a service to you and it makes things easier for you. So I would earn 50 cents off of you and you would get to have the the clean windshield. We can compare this to the dollars earned or the, the increased wealth of all the billionaires around the world, which currently stands at something like $3.9 trillion over the course of this pandemic, mm-hmm. with the decreased wealth of working class people. So working class people have lost about $3.7 trillion over the course of the pandemic. Now, a lot of people would point out and say, you know, is this a coincidence? And I say, no, it isn't a coincidence. So when I go to the grocery store, for example, and I buy, let's say, a six-pack of beer and a steak for dinner, and I give them $20, it's true. I am $20 poorer as a result of that exchange, and the grocery store is $20 wealthier as a result of that exchange. And so if we looked only at the dollars, yeah, I lost 20 bucks and they gained 20 bucks. But if we look at the other side of the ledger, which is the goods changing hands, I'm plus a steak and beer and they're down a steak and beer. Now, the only reason I would engage in that trade is because I value the steak and the beer more than the $20. And the only reason the grocery store would engage in that exchange is because they value the $20 more than the steak and the beer. As a result, both of us are made better off. This is why it's very common for uh, customers at the grocery store to say thank you to the cashier and then for the cashier to say thank you in return. Mm -hmm. It would be weird if the cashier said, oh, you're welcome. We would kind of look at them like, what are you doing, right? The reason why we're both saying thank you is because both parties have gained from that exchange, And so when we see that the billionaires in the world have made $3.9 trillion over the course of this pandemic, and working class people have lost $3.7 trillion over the course of this pandemic, we can learn two things. One is that the dollar side of the ledger, it's true. The billionaires have more money and the working class people have less. That's called purchasing. It's also the case that if we look at this, The working class people contributed $3.7 trillion worth of spending toward the billionaires and the services that they were providing, and the billionaires got $3.9 trillion. So if we think about this, the billionaires made their money specifically by serving the working class people almost exclusively, 
right? Because we have $3.7 trillion worth of revenue coming from working class people, $3.9 trillion worth of income earned by the billionaires. That only leaves $0.2 billion remaining coming from the non-working class people, also known as primarily the rich. So if you want to get rich in society, the best way to do this is not to serve wealthy people because there's so few of them. The best way to do it is actually to serve the working class people. And the billionaires are the people who have figured out how to do that better than almost everyone else. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the objection that some, I believe, would raise that when we're looking at that transaction, uh, that you have the $3.7 billion, quote unquote, lost mm -hmm. by working class people and $3.9 billion gained mm -hmm. by all of the billionaires in the world, who looks at the people, the number of people mm -hmm. in that $3.9 billion figure and says, you know, you could if you needed to, recount the names of every single one of those billionaires. Yeah. But of the 3.7 uh, billion lost from working class people everywhere, mm -hmm. we're talking millions and millions and millions of people that, yes, they're, they're gaining uh, certain tangible goods and services that they need. It's costing them money, mm -hmm. and it's all accumulating to a handful of already very, very wealthy people and that there's a fundamental unfairness in that mm -hmm. allocation of all of this wealth to these people at the very top who are already wealthy to begin with. Yeah. And the diminution of any kind of wealth or assets being held by the working class people who are buying the services. You raise a very good question, right? The question is about the growing income inequality, the growing uh, diversification or the growing divergence perhaps between – the upper echelons of society and the rest of us. The wealth inequality yeah, as well the as wealth, income inequality. Right. The, the wealth is probably the better. Wealth inequality is the better way to put it. Okay. Now, that's very true. As an economist, I am not perhaps as concerned about this as other people might be. I tend to look at the world as how easily can people make their lives better off, Right. And so in this case, we think about the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Facebooks, the Zooms of the world. And let's imagine what the world would be like during the pandemic without those companies. So now there's no such thing as Amazon. How would the millions of people around the world have had access to not just the necessities of life, food, books to read, those types of things, but what about the entertainment value? So with Amazon Prime comes Amazon Prime Video, right? Amazon Prime Music, right? All of these different services are bundled in there. And while we can point out and say that, you know, maybe it's not as important to society that I be able to watch, you know, some movie on, on Amazon Prime or on Netflix or anything like that. At the same time, we know that entertainment is valuable, and so having access to that without having to leave the home during a time when leaving the house is potentially fraught with danger is really important. What would our lives be like without that? Well, they'd be much worse off. And so to me, I'm not as concerned with growing inequality uh, as other people might be. I look at the growing access to this new wealth that we have. And the wealth is in the form of the goods and services that we all have access to. So think about how readily available a cell phone is today compared to a cell phone in 1985 or 1995 for that matter, right? Today, virtually every single American has a magical piece of glass that if you touch it a few times in a few certain areas, a sandwich from Jimmy John's will show up at your door. That is something that is completely unthinkable to even like your grandparents. It brings to mind the quote that um, any type of technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Yeah. Our cell phones are quite literally magic devices. Like if you could go back to the time of John Rockefeller, for example, and show him a cell phone and let's pretend it worked and everything. Sure. He would absolutely trade everything that he owned for that cell phone. And there's no doubt about that in my mind. So in a very real sense, yeah, it's true that people like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Sergey Brin, you know, all these people around the world, sure, they can buy, you know, 12 yachts. That's fantastic. 
I can order a sandwich from my pocket. That's pretty cool. And so in a very real sense, everyone is being lifted way out of poverty than we've – farther out of poverty than we've ever been in our lives. And so, you know, is it fair? Yeah, it probably is because at the same time as all this tremendous growth in, you know, the, the wealth inequality around the world, what we're seeing is tremendous innovation on the part of people like Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and even – Elon Musk. I mean, think about what Elon Musk has done for the world. He has basically brought us the first real viable electric car. In a world where we're concerned about environmental pollution, rising CO2 levels, fossil fuel emissions and everything, what Elon Musk has done is basically made it so that millions of Americans can actually switch to an electric vehicle and thereby reduce their carbon emissions. That's fantastic. And if he becomes fantastically wealthy from doing so, that's well-deserved. He has served not just the people who buy Teslas, but also everyone in the world in the form of reduced CO2 emissions. And as a result of his service to everyone else, he has now become the wealthiest person on the planet. Mm -hmm. Before we get back to this episode of Act in Line, I want to take a moment to tell you about our newest podcast, Acton Institute Events. The Acton Institute's international events include public lectures, academic seminars, joint participation in panels, the annual Acton University Conference, the Institute's annual dinner, and more, all focused on illustrating our vision of a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained by religious principles. Previous event speakers have included Acton's own Reverend Robert Sirico, Samuel Gregg, and Michael Matheson Miller. Other speakers have included P.J. O'Rourke, Yuval Levin, Anthony Bradley, Arthur Brooks, Jonah Goldberg, Stephanie Slade, Bradley Berzer, Ann Rathbone Bradley, and many others. To subscribe to the Acton Institute Events podcast, look for a link in the show notes for this episode of Acton Line, or just search Acton Institute Events on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Now, back to the show. Hey, before we get back to this episode of Acton Line, I want to take a moment to tell you about a fantastic upcoming event from the Acton Institute. On February 25th, the Acton Institute will host Business Matters, Certain Principles for Uncertain Times. This is Acton's premier event on business, now entirely online. We are in the midst of volatile times. From civil unrest and political turmoil to a prolonged pandemic that has forced businesses to redefine themselves. In 2021, this volatility will challenge businesses to survive while upholding their values and operating in a moral way. In such a time, how can we fulfill our responsibilities without compromising our ethical principles? Please join us on February 25th from 1 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time when top experts and CEOs will confront the current risks and equip us with principles to lean on as we navigate the coming challenges. Visit acton.org slash business matters to learn more and register. And when you register, use the promo code ACTONLINE to get 50% off the registration fee of $50. That's only $25 for full access to our Business Matters Conference when you go to acton.org slash business matters and use the promo code ACTONLINE, all one word, at checkout. Now back to the show. You bring up John Rockefeller and the, the typical example that I hear given is that you know Rockefeller having been the wealthiest person of his time, well, your average middle class person – lives a wealthier life now than John Rockefeller did in his time because they have access to things like you know, um, easy availability of electricity, um, the kind of yeah. computer in your pocket that we have that are all available things. We've seen the evolution of the definition of poverty, at least in the United States, to include things like you own a TV, you own right. a car, you own a cell phone, things that would have been completely unthinkable 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and you see it also in terms of what you can purchase with the wealth you have. And, and comparatively speaking, that of course, yes, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk can own uh, 12 yachts. They can own right. a private jet. But, you know, I can purchase the same quality of a cell phone that they can. And I can uh, have almost as good a quality food as they can, mm -hmm. um, or at least equally as nourishing food as they can. Right. And it's even further highlighted, I think, by the work of Don Boudreau, the economist at George Mason University, mm -hmm. who has compared, you know, using, I think, old Sears catalogs, yeah. how many hours you would have to work mm -hmm. in order to afford the things that we all would generally expect to have in our homes. Like a microwave might have cost you, and I'm making these numbers up off the top of my head, you might have had to work eight hours to be able to afford a microwave in the, you know, 1960s. Right. And now it would take maybe even a less than an hour's worth of work for most people to be able to afford the same microwave from right. the local Walmart or Target. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going on is while it might be true that the dollar income earned is growing at a slower rate or perhaps even declining for certain sectors of the economy, what's also true is that the time price so the amount of time that you have to give up in order to acquire basically anything in the country uh, has gone down remarkably everything is now abundantly more uh, available and available more cheaply than it has ever been you know so remember 10 years ago or so gas was about 450 a gallon right and today i just drove past a gas station it was two dollars and 40 cents so even before we account for inflation, gas prices have already cut, been cut in half. That's a remarkable feat. And now because there's more gas available, people can afford to drive further. They can afford to have their car and go to work more easily. This is a tremendous benefit for everyone. We can also think about this in terms of our access to the goods and services and what that's done to the level that we now define as poverty, as you brought up. So today's level for poverty is so much higher than any level of, of real wealth that even Rockefeller could have ever imagined. You know, Rockefeller, by our standard of, of poverty today with, you know, the owning of a television, having a car, right, all these other things, Rockefeller would be poor, because he doesn't have a, a television, right? And so all these things that, that we have, the story basically of capitalism is taking things that only rich people could have dreamed to have access to and making them available to the masses. And so while it's true that maybe Jeff Bezos can have 12 yachts and I can't even have one, I can still go out and get a kayak. And my kayak is just as good as any kayak that Jeff Bezos could get you know, maybe with a little bit of room for improvement if you're a, a kayak aficionado, right? But to the average person, the kayak I've got is basically the same that, that Jeff Bezos would get. The cell phone that we're both using is basically the same cell phone that Jeff Bezos would have. Or to go back to ships, you could, if such a thing existed, and perhaps this is a business idea, if there's an Uber for yachts, <laughs> you can buy a share of a time on a contraption like that without mm -hmm. having to make the purchase. You even see this actually with, I don't know if Uber still offers it, but for a while in major cities, mm -hmm. Uber offered helicopter service. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Of course, you couldn't afford a helicopter on your own, but right. could you afford the price of a helicopter trip from uh, a skyscraper in midtown Manhattan out to the airport in Islip? Well, mm -hmm. you probably very well could have. Yeah. So we do see this quite a bit. So we see it in boats. Uh, it's especially common in Florida. Uh, we also see this in actually airplanes. So owning a private jet has traditionally been reserved only for the ultra wealthy because they're the only ones who could afford to, you know, pay, pay for the, the plane, pay for the hangar space, pay a pilot to fly it. But now what we actually see is a rise of what are called flight clubs. And so what happens is a group of people get together, they buy an airplane and then they all own shares in that airplane and can fly it around whenever they want. And what they're recognizing is that no one of them really needs 24-7 access to a plane, but they all might like to have, you know, one hour every seven days access to a plane or two hours or maybe just the day. And so what ends up happening is now this thing called private flight is now more available to 
all sorts of people around the world. But we can do it even simpler. So if you look at the time cost of an airplane ticket in the 1960s or 70s, right, air travel was reserved basically only for the upper middle class people. This is why if you look at uh, pictures of people on airplanes from that time period, they're almost all wearing suits and ties and they're like dressed up for an occasion because it was a big deal to go on an airplane. Today, well, maybe not today because of the pandemic, but in, in non-pandemic times, airplanes are actually not that expensive. Sure, the seats are a little more crammed. You might not have as much storage space in the, the bins above you. But for the most part, I don't know of anyone who's ever run out of storage space on the plane and been unable to carry something with them, right? Now, if they're carrying more than two you know, carry-on items, yes, that's a difference. But in terms of like the size of their luggage... If it's on the plane, no problem. And so we look at these costs that have all come down for everyone, not just the rich. And we can see the massively increased value or the increased satisfaction with everyone's livelihoods. Now, part of the issue is that we tend to compare ourselves to the people around us. And so rather than looking at like ourselves versus our parents' generation, we look at how we're doing compared to our neighbors. And maybe our neighbors are getting wealthier or having access to fancier things faster than we are. And that makes us feel sad. I don't think it should. I think we should look at what we're able to do and whether or not it satisfies us. And in that respect, people have never been happier than they are today. What's interesting is that for some reason, they're quite not happy. You actually dovetail that beautifully into what I wanted to ask you next, which is maybe a little bit out of your expertise uh, as an economist. Mm -hmm. But it is that point uh, that we can make these comparisons, that we can tell people these stories of compared to Rockefeller, you're wealthier than he ever could have imagined, mm -hmm. uh, that the standard of living has increased uh, incredibly so that a definition of poverty includes things that would have been unthinkable 30, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you're right. There is this sense that people are unhappy with yeah. this reality, that they are not – feeling as comfortable or safe or rewarded for that experience as they at least would ex seem to expect to be. Mm -hmm. And that when they look at people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and they see the uh, this accumulation of wealth in – so much wealth in mm -hmm. the hands of such a small number of people that it creates – social problems. Yeah. How, and I'm not asking for a solution to all of this because <laughs> of course, if, if we all knew the exact solution to all of this, we'd pursue it immediately. Right. But how do you go about dealing with those circumstances? Um, you can't really argue somebody into the point of view of, no, you should be happy. And right. they end up at the end of the <laughs> argument, oh, well, I guess I am really happy. Right. <laughs> how do we deal with these circumstances where we may all be better off, mm -hmm. but we don't really feel like it. Yeah. You're hitting on one of the most important questions in, in, in all of society and not just in economics is why is there such tremendous unhappiness amidst, amidst plenty? So we've all heard about, you know, poverty amidst plenty where some people are, are fantastically rich and other people are abysmally poor. That exists. Okay. Why is there such unhappiness amidst so much material wealth? And that's where I don't know what the answer might be. I tend to try to think about it in terms of what I'm putting in to get something out, right? So what I have to do in order to get the things that I want. And in that respect, it's lower than it's ever been. We can also think about it maybe as an increase in the division of labor. And so now – because there are more specialized people. So as an example, uh, my father used to work for a company that made very high precision screws and that was it. Okay, So they didn't make anything else. All they did was make very, very highly precise screws, like the types you would find in your cell phone, in your watch, maybe your headphones, you know, those types of screws, not the ones you find at, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot. Okay, And that's it. Right. So in terms of their value added to the final product that is perhaps a phone or a watch, 
the screw is a very, very tiny component, right? Both literally and figuratively in the sense that like, yeah, their value added to that, that product is low, but they're making so many of them that a low value times a high quantity is a tremendously valuable you know, company. So it could be the case that there seems to be like a disconnect between the work that we're doing. So how hard we're all working because we're all contributing a very small portion toward this final product, right? So think about, you know, making your cell phone, for example. Someone has to make the glass, which probably means that some company makes a giant sheet of glass, and then that glass has to be scored and cut, right? And those are all steps that maybe if we did this, you know, 20 years ago, maybe one person would do a greater portion of the work that goes into making your cell phone. And as a result, they would make more money per cell phone than they did, than they do now. The issue is that now, because of the increased division of labor, I might make less money per cell phone that I contribute to because there are so many more people contributing toward the production of that phone. But because of the increased division of labor, I'm able to contribute to far more cell phones than I ever could. And so as a result... I make less money per phone, but I'm making so many more phones per day or per year or whatever it is that I actually am making more money than I was when I was earning more money per phone but contributing toward a smaller number of phones. So it could be something as simple as uh, the, the difficulty with recognizing, you know, I've contributed to 10,000 phones today. Shouldn't I be paid the value of 10,000 phones? And well, the answer is no, you should be paid a fraction of the value of those 10,000 phones times the number of phones you produced, right? And that fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it could be something as simple as that, that we just, we somehow have a disconnect between the tremendous division of labor that we've seen and the tremendous amount of specialization and some sort of a, a shift that just hasn't quite happened yet. It could also be um, so Mike Munger, the, uh, the economist at Duke or the political scientist at Duke, has a great book out called Tomorrow 3.0. Uh, and what he is describing there is that we've basically lived through uh, two revolutions right now or so far. One was the agricultural revolution where we learned how to plant and then we therefore knew where the crops would be because we put them there. The second was the industrial revolution, which learned we learned how to specialize and produce more things. And then this new one, um, I forget the exact word that he uses, but it's like the platform revolution, which is basically where uh, we have access to these platforms that allow us to share things. So Uber, for example, allows me to rent out a seat in my car for money, which means that other people don't need to buy a car. They can hire me to drive them around, okay? But because I own the platform, which is my car, I'm the one that makes money off of the car, right? And then Uber is its own platform, and they're the ones that are coordinating, you know, matching the drivers with the riders, so they get to make a share. So because Uber owns that platform, they're making tremendous amounts of money. And now there's just few, there aren't that many platforms out there. So like Amazon might be a platform, YouTube might be a platform, Google itself is probably a platform at this point. And so because of how much value we all derive from these platforms, the owners of those platforms earn a tremendous amount of money. But again, as before and as has always been true, the only way that they're earning money is by serving other people, right? They're not coming in and stealing your money from you. They are actually providing a service to you. And as a result of millions upon millions of people who are choosing freely of their own accord to engage in this service, the owners of those platforms make a lot of money. And this is kind of the big point is if it might be like, let's say it is true that some people are making tons and tons of money and other people aren't. I think that's true. Okay. If we wanted to fix that problem, what we would be doing is basically saying that you disagree with the collective decisions of millions and millions of people around the world, which led to the result that some people made a lot of money and other people didn't, and then trying to fix that, right? Because as we know, income isn't like 
created and then somehow distributed according to some master plan. There's no puppet master who is collecting all of the money and then deciding that Jeff Bezos gets, you know, this many billions, whereas you and I get this many tens of thousands, right? That's not what happens. What happens is millions upon millions of people decide that they want to shop on Amazon. And as a result of that, Jeff Bezos gets millions and millions of ton- of fractions of a dollar off of those individual uh, transactions. And that multiplies up into him having billions of dollars. In a way, do you think these systems that you have just described, the fraction of a contribution that we make to the creation of a phone or the way that Jeff Bezos makes a fraction of a dollar off of each transaction at Amazon, that these systems are so efficient that they become a victim of their own success, that you don't have, uh, in the example you gave, that tangible output at the end of the day that, like, I made this phone in the same way that I made these this pair of shoes. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have that single tangible output, and it's harder to grasp your contribution as a result. We've gotten wealthier, Mm -hmm. Clearly, because we've gotten more efficient over time, but that efficiency destroys our sense of meaning in what it is that we're doing. That's a combination both of an economics problem Mm -hmm. and a civic, perhaps educational, Mm -hmm. um, religious in some senses, Mm -hmm. problem of meaning and value in our lives. Yeah. So – One of the examples I I love to to give is, you know, contract workers or construction workers. If you ever have the fortune to be able to drive around in a neighborhood with the guy or the person who built some of the houses in there, one of the fun things to do is to watch how many times they point out the window and say, see that building over there? I built that, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when I was in high school, one of my buddies worked as uh, as a drywall you know, installer, right? And he could go into any building in town and he knew where he had screwed up. And so he could point out the flaws in all the buildings and everything that were in town and say like, oh yeah, I screwed up over there, right? Or like, you know, I solved that tricky corner by doing this. And so he knew what he had contributed. In today's world, it's much harder to know, to be able to point to the things that you actually contributed. And part of that is because of this increased division of labor. So, we might not know what it is. Like I can't specifically point to, you know, one of my students and say, I made that, right? I can't do that in the same way that maybe a grade school teacher could from a few years ago who would see the same student for four, five, six years straight all day, right? I am lucky if I teach the same student maybe twice over the course of their four years, maybe three or four times at the absolute most. And so my input into that student's development is much smaller than the school teacher from way back in the day. And so maybe there's some sense of, you know, what did I actually contribute? Like, what have I done? You know, you've worked really hard. You worked all day at it. But it's harder to point specifically to what you have actually done than perhaps it has in the past. And maybe that's part of our uh, the root cause of our, our less happiness than we probably should have. And I'm making a bit of a normative claim there. And right? I'm not saying that people actually should be happier, right? Like you said, I can't, there's nothing I could say to someone who was unhappy that would prove to them that they should be happy, right? It couldn't be done. And so, yeah, this is a difficult, this is a difficult question. Let's conclude here. So one of the something that you referenced earlier in our conversation was how things that we may not have thought were really important before Mm -hmm. this pandemic set in, we realize their importance during it. Mm -hmm. Um, Amazon Prime and the video that you get from that or Netflix and and forms of entertainment as we were all stuck in our houses Mm -hmm. being one of those that we certainly appreciated before, but probably appreciated in a different way throughout especially the early months of this when we really were stuck inside and unable to get out of, Mm -hmm. of our homes. I remember having an argument 
with a friend of mine about the period of time between mid-March or so and when you had the return of any kind of sports. Yeah. That his argument was, you know, it was like we, you know, they shouldn't be bringing him back. It's still, you had all the problems with Major League Baseball, Mm -hmm. with the NBA. Um, The National Hockey League was pretty successful in in bubbling and and being able to get by without any cases of, of coronavirus. But the risk is too great and, you know, we shouldn't be bringing it back. And my argument was... But maybe we probably should Mm -hmm. because people need the things that make life worth living and those forms of enjoyment, things that bring people joy, Mm -hmm. make life worth living. We heard this term thrown around a lot of essential workers that – You know, we know, oh, we need essential workers, the ones who work in grocery stores and the ones who work in the medical field. Clearly, those are essential. Mm -hmm. But to, you know, the person who sold peanuts at a baseball game, they're an essential worker Mm -hmm. because to them, their work is essential. Right. Should, as we come out of this, should we have a better appreciation for we may not be able to recognize in a moment what is truly essential because just because it's not essential to us or we might be able to do without it, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there who probably couldn't do without it or at minimum really don't want to do without it because it's something that brings them joy, Mm -hmm. makes them happy, and in difficult circumstances like this makes life easier to get by with. Yeah, so... I really – I don't like the term essential worker. I think the better way to look at it would have been to think about safe workers. So what can we do safely, right? Rather than think about who is essential and who is inessential or unessential, right? Think about who could be done or what could be done in a safe manner. And I think what you've hit at is different people have different valuations about what is important to them and what's not. So it might be the case that Jeff Bezos has – a massive mega mansion with an indoor basketball court and a movie theater and a golf course and whatever, okay? But all the riches in the world aren't worth anything if you have no one to share them with. And I think that's been the big thing that we've learned from this pandemic. Sure, Netflix subscriptions are higher than ever. Hulu subscriptions too. Amazon Prime added something like 10 million new subscribers over the course of the pandemic. That's all great. That meets your material needs. But we also know that we are a social animal. We have a desire and a need, frankly, to be among other people. And not just in a way that I can see their face on a screen, but to physically be with them. And perhaps even to be able to shake their hand or give them a hug. And these were all things that we could not do or we haven't been able to do, frankly, for almost a year. Now, that imposes tremendous costs on people. So Jeff Bezos might have access to all those things. I bet you he is just as miserable as the rest of us right now, even though he has many forms of entertainment that he could choose to use that many forms that you and I don't have, right? He probably has a PS5. Let's be real. I don't have one, okay? But without someone to enjoy those things with, they're not nearly worth as much as you might think. You know, think about the reason why you might have like a big screen television isn't so that you can watch a TV, you know, your TV show on a big screen. It's so that you and your friends can watch it together. And if you can't do that, well, then the TV's not worth as much to you. So it's no mystery to me that, that people are unhappy right now. That's a given. And frankly, they should be unhappy right now because we've lost the ability to have those meaningful connections with each other. Dr. David Hebert is chair of the economics department and associate professor of economics at Aquinas College. David, thank you so much for joining us on Act Online today. Thank you so much. It was great fun. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, 
you can reach our team at actonline at acton.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Combs.